Well, hello, Church History friends, and welcome to the Stories of the Scattered Saints Spring Lecture Series. My name is Barb Walden, and I'm feeling a mixture of emotions as I welcome you to tonight's program. We are excited to welcome Melvin Johnson and hear the story behind the old wild ram, Lyman White, but we're also a little sad that tonight's program is the final lecture in the Spring Lecture Series. I hope you all have enjoyed gathering with us over the past four weeks as much as we have enjoyed gathering and, and hosting you. We have learned a lot of new stories about the scattered saints from our guest historians, and I'm grateful that we had the chance to journey down the Restoration Trail with all of you this spring. Thank you for joining us. I think a highlight of the spring series has been working with my two co-hosts, Peter Smith and Lexi Frazier. These two are always taking care of business behind the scenes, and we couldn't host these online programs without them. Um, Peter wears a lot of hats as he serves as a board member for the Historic Sites Foundation, and he's a co-host for our annual Historic Site Bus Tour, which is going to be taking off this October in just a few months. While Lexi is serving her second year as a summer intern in the Alma Blair Internship Program at the Kirtland Temple. Uh, it's good to have both of you here for our final night of the spring series. Now, the spring lecture series is not only a great time to get together with your fellow church history enthusiasts, it's also an opportunity to help support church heritage. Our generous board of directors is offering a $20,000 matching gift opportunity for the spring campaign. And I'm happy to report that there's still time and plenty of matching funds available to double your donation this week. The spring campaign raises funds for young adults serving as interns at the Community of Christ Historic Sites in Nauvoo and Kirtland. It's a life-changing program named in honor of the great Alma Blair, the college professor who served as a summer instructor in Nauvoo for 30 years. And so we invite you to join us in honoring Alma Blair's legacy by helping fund this life-changing program. The goal of the campaign is to raise $50,000 to fund eight young adults serving in the internship program. So you can use the QR code to make a donation and Lexi will also drop the online donation link and mailing address into the chat for anyone who wishes to make a donation tonight. We thank you all for your consideration and for helping preserve both Alma's enduring legacy and church heritage through your generous support. Uh, we are doing things a little different this evening and our guest historian, Melvin C. Johnson, will share a formal lecture at the start of the program. And the lecture will be followed by a brief interview with Mel, led by yours truly, where we'll dive into the specifics related to the RLDS connection with Lyman White and his followers. And speaking of guest historian, it's my pleasure to introduce you to Mel Johnson, our speaker for tonight. Melvin Clarno Johnson was raised in Southern California at Carlsbad by the Sea. He was educated in Utah and served 12 years active duty in the US Army. He taught history and English in Texas as well. His interest in Lyman White and his colony began with remarks in his research into the East Texas mill town culture and forest industry about the quote Mormon millers in the central Texas hill country before 1860. Ron Romig and Barbara Bernauer shared with him important leads to the Zodiac Temple Register and the John Pierce Holly autobiography in the Community of Christ archives in Independence, Missouri. Uh, and Mel took off from there. Uh, he's been a member of the John Whitmer Historical Association since 1996. In fact, two of his published works have received the best book awards from the John Whitmer Historical Association. Uh, we're excited Mel's here with us tonight. His presentation is called Lyman White and Mormon Trails in Texas Dust, the Wild Ram and His Flock in the Texas Hill Country. So welcome Mel, the spotlight is all yours as we're ready to hear about Lyman White and his connections to the reorganization. Thank, thank you very much. I've been excited to see the uh, number of new people that new friends, old friends, will be friends. We've got a great group here. 
And I so much want to thank Barb Walden, Peter Smith, Lexi for this. It's outstanding. I've been reading about summer encampments and reunions in the RLDS tradition during the summers. And I almost have a feeling of spirit that we are within that encampment mindset with this program. We are sharing memories, creating memories, learning about our past and where our future may go. Lyman White is important to me. It began in 1994 at the Texas Forestry Museum where I began to get these leads on something called the Mormon Millers of Central Texas before the Civil War. And since my graduate work had been on the Texas German immigrants to the Hill Country before the Civil War, I was excited and I have been on a 30-year journey. Let's begin with Lyman White. Strong face, strong body, born in 1796 in Connecticut, farming stock. As an older teenager, he participated in the War of 1812, received land bounty grants, and went west as hundreds of thousands did. He married Harriet Benton. She was 22, he was 26. This is a traditional picture that is considered to be Lyman and Harriet. You look at the lower picture, Orange Lysander White and his, his older son, his two wives and an aged Harriet, his mother, as they moved to Nebraska after the death of Lyman. I'm going to hold that slide on for a moment. And I want to get him into Kirtland about 1828. He and a number of other local families are converted by Sidney Rigdon to the Campbell Light, Blue Light sect apostolic primitives. He and seven other families, two of them led by Isaac Morley and his brother-in-law, Titus Billings, to create a commune. As you stand on the east side of the temple and you look out across the river to the far hillsides, where that upsweep of the land begins. That's where their farm was. Eight families in a communitarian common property state run by the seven elders. It was an agricultural and milling combination. In 1830 and 1831, they are converted by Parley Pratt and his companions to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The next few years for Lyman, he moves back and forth from Ohio to Missouri on church business. He is a mighty preacher, a strong evangelist, preaching on the banks of the Ohio and Cincinnati. He converts hundreds and baptizes them in the river. He is in far west, and actually, the Mormon militia regiment commander in the Mormon Missouri Civil War. This is not a vigilante war as such as Brother Lesur noted. It was more than that. This was state militia regiments of Mormons fighting old settlers. Lyman was the commander of the 56th Regiment. As such, he led raids against old settler communities like Gallatin, Millport. They looted them, drove the people out, and torched the small villages. He was taken prisoner, 
and when offered his life in exchange for testimony condemning Joseph Smith, he allegedly ripped open his shirt and said, shoot and be damned. He was committed to Joseph all of his life, served in Liberty Jail with him, escaped with Joseph, made it to Illinois where he continued the work in the church, became a member of the Quorum of Twelve in 1841, and his next big assignment is up here in the Black River Pine Mission from 1841 to 1844. Lyman, Bishop George Miller, Alpheus Cutler. I pronounced that name wrong for years. I would say Alpheus. And I was told, no, Mel, sound normal. It's Alpheus Cutler and others. They established a sawmill center at Black River Falls, Roaring Creek, Nielsville, Greenwood, and other places were logging fronts. They would move lumber down to the mill where it was sawed into timber, into lumber and planking, rafted down the Black River, and then all the way down to Nauvoo. Lower left is a picture. You have animals dragging drop timber to the mill. Here you have a color portrait of men on a log raft. What they would do is lay their timber or their lumber and then chain them around on the outside and on which they were able to construct little shacks and other endeavors that would help them as they floated down the river. They would not float at night. They would chain up on the side of the bank until the sun came up again. I want to reinforce the concept of just how primitive the material culture was on the frontier. You can see a Native American teepee back here. You can see how low the roofs are. Chinking. Here's a very formalized, gentrified portrait at the bottom where you can see the mud and the lime being molded into the cracks between the timber. That would often fall out. And in a winter night with the wind blowing, the inside of the cabin could be very cold. These primitive chimneys often cracked and would create a fire endangering the family and whatever animals were inside. This was began as generally a failure until Bishop George Miller, a good businessman, took over the books in the business side of it and by Late 1842, they were running a profit. They would float the timber down the river to Nauvoo or the Nauvoo House, the building of the temple, and constructing homes for the immigrant influx from Europe. By the winter of 1843 to 1844, the Mormon elders had managed, as they generally did, to draw the attention of federal officials and then their ire. This time it was Indian agents for the indigenous peoples and they started interfering with the contracts for timber. This led to Apostle White and Bishop Miller in the bishopric to send a letter on 15 February 1844 to Joseph Smith. That letter said, we want to move to the Republic of Texas. We wish to start a mission to the Lamanites. 
we wish to convert rich slaveholders that will help sustain the church economically. We wish to create a colony outside of the United States where we will be protected from what they consider to be the persecutions of the federal government. Joseph Smith was excited. Out of this, the Council of 50 was organized to create a plan to get the church out of Nauvoo and to the West somewhere where it could grow and be nourished and protected. Joseph called Lyman in that spring of 1844 in Nauvoo to lead a mission to Texas. Earlier, he had dispatched Lucian Woodworth, nicknamed the Pagan Prophet, to the Republic. Lucian had gone down the Mississippi River, steamship to cross the Gulf to the Republic. He met with the president, Sam Houston. Houston was thrilled with the idea of a host of bloodthirsty armed Mormons that he could put on the Northwest frontier between his small villages and the Comanche, the Kiowa, the Lipan Apache and other native tribes. He said, but I've got to talk to the Congress that meets in December this year. I will give it a favorable recommendation. Lucien returned to Nauvoo. The council approved the idea. Joseph called Lyman White to lead that colony, his Black Pine River colony, set him apart, gave him a seer stone and a commission to go to the Republic with his company. Well, those tragic days in the last week of June, 1844 came. Joseph and his brother Hiram were slain. The church was thrown into an uproar. And then on August 8th, 1844, the church, after a conference, selected the Quorum of the Twelve with Brigham Young at the head to lead the church. Brigham Young initially agreed with the mission to Texas. Lyman White took his colony back up river to La Crosse to winter. At Mormon Coulee, they built these little cabins. And then the next spring, they began down river, headed for the Republic of Texas. I have added to the Community of Christ Historic Sites Foundation map to show just how widespread the Mormon expansion was. 500,000 immigrants would go west beyond the Mississippi. 500,000, a half million. And one out of every seven was some kind of Mormon, a Brighamite, a Josephite, a Strangite, a Thisite, a Thatite, a Whiteite. By the time it was done in 1868, you had Mormons, and I use the term very loosely, restorationists uh, in Minnesota, Iowa, Nebraska, Missouri. They were in Oklahoma, well, actually the Indian nations in the Indian territory. They were in Texas, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, Idaho, Nevada, Colorado, and Arizona. It seemed that there were restorationists everywhere. Here we have various leaders of uh, the denominations. Of course, Brigham Young's people thought everybody else were schismatics. Everybody else thought they had the true Restoration Church. And to an extent, that still continues today. Notice a map here. By the 1860s, we had seen the West developed into the restoration world in which the RLDS 
would be formed, the Strangite world in the 1840s and the 1850s, the Latter-day Saint world in the West, and the Mormon corridor went all the way from Idaho and Wyoming down into Northern Mexico. You had splinter offshoots. Ah, I misspelled that. Cutlerites, not Coulterites. That was not a de deliberate smear. That's my error, and I will correct it. William Smith's cult in Covington, Kentucky in 1850, they would actually join with the Whiteites in a combination for a year, and they would send a party down to Texas to go through the Zodiac Temple and receive their endowments. Beginning in the early 1850s, you had free range Mormons moving north out of Texas and then white eye schisms led to the Hollies, the Slades, the Crofts, living in the nations for several years. That is my primary research topic right now, and hopefully I'll have an article out on the Mormon transients in the five nations. It's a fun story. In the meantime, we have White and Company moving down the river. By the end of 1845, notice this map, the old map of Texas when it comes into the Union in 1845. You have part of almost all of Oklahoma in it. And the Whiteites stop on the north side, on the south side of the Red River for the winter at a place called Mormon Grove. They encamped in an abandoned fort and then in the spring of 1846, they came down to Austin. We see Fredericksburg over here, about 60, 65 miles to the west, a Texas German immigrant company that came in 1845, a year before the Whiteites arrived in Wash, uh, Austin. This map here we'll see in a second, but it shows the expansion from Austin on the right to Zodiac in 1847, to Mormon Mills in Burnett County. And a lot of you will try to do what I did and call it Burnett, don't you dare, they'll jump on you. They'll say, burn it, learn it, darn it, and you'll never forget it. In 1853, the White Ikes go brat broke and the first schisms begin to occur. They come down to Mountain Valley on the south side of the Medina River in Medina County. And they're busted there by 1855. And then they come up to Bandera, a brand new village in the western portion of the central Texas hill country. They'll live there for three years. And then Lyman White will say, we need to go back up to the Midwest. And he will take about 80 odd members and he will die at Dexter two days into the journey, uh, epilepsy of laudanum, opium and alcohol addiction. About 60 members will stay in Bandera in Fredericksburg, up here. A few families will go to California and about 70 will go to Iowa. Most of them sent settling in Gallons Grove. Here's a better map of that. It gives you a better view of the distances. What is neat about this, Fredericksburg is only about 50 miles from Bandera and about that to Burnett and Mormon Mills. Uh, our two main tours, I will lead one up to Mormon Mills and Eric Paul Rogers will lead one down to Bandera. Both of them will be full of action and history and excitement. 
you'll need to register early because they will sell out. In the spring of 1846, the Mormons are just about here at Sycamore Springs. Austin is a big village then, no more than 800 people. They don't want those Mormons there. Noah Smithwick, a very valued member of the Texian community said, let's rethink this. They are armed. They have milling equipment that we don't. The ladies of Austin were still grinding corn and grain by hand in a mortar with a pestle. Hard work. And the members said, huzzah, we like that, and allowed the Mormons to stay. They built the jail, the Mormons did. They helped work on the Capitol building. At the end of the building season, they swung around Austin to Bee Creek. And those of you, when you come in from the airport and you cross over the river just south of town, you look to the right and you'll see Vanell Mountain and just to the west across the river is Bee Creek. You'll be able to look right down into it. 1847, they're in Zodiac. 1851, in the mills. And then the final years in Bandera County. Here is an RLDS um, investigative mission set out to find out about the Whiteites. One of Lyman's sons had been, John W. White, had been an RLDS apostle for almost 20 years. Uh, his son-in-law, Spencer Smith, Heman Cordemon Smith, and then Heman Hale Smith became RLDS historians over an almost 60 year period. This is the Zodiac historical marker. And this is me down in the lower right being photographed by Bill Shepard from Voree, Wisconsin, more than 20 years ago. Bill and I had a great time out at Zodiac. He showed me that wonderful cleft down on the river that had been a Neopaleolithic hunting ground 8,000 years ago. And we found awls and needles and spear points and other wonderful things. A picture of grinding corn mechanically and sawing lumber with a sash saw. That means the saw goes up and down and the timber is pushed across it very slow. You might get 2,000 board feet a day. Living conditions were primitive. This is allegedly a white-eyed house in Fredericksburg in the last half or post white eyed house in the last 40 years of the 19th century. I'm not so sure we can't do the providence, but it's very realistic of how everybody lived at the time. I cannot tell you how beautiful the Pedernalis, the Texans will call it Pedernalis, the river is in the spring. Cottonwood, beech, black and live oak, still full of wildlife and birds. When Bill and I were on the Zodiac cemetery lot, it was plowed under in the 1930s by the owner, so it would not be uh, given historic status to the extent that he could not use the land for plowing. When we were standing next to that marker, Bill and I looked to the north. It was early in the morning and we could see a herd of 30 deer moving through the trees. 
this is an important slide. This is a common figure, the angel of manifest destiny of the white immigration into the West. You'll see the Native Americans fleeing before them, the bison fleeing, immigrants, stagecoaches, Pony Express, the stagecoach, and the coming of the railroad, civilization. We have a number of pictures here uh, that imaginations of what Zodiac looked like. Uh, you'll notice they all have outhouses. That part they've got right. I would imagine that Kim Wells Greenings painting here is probably the closest representative as how they actually lived. Let me go back. This is the storehouse temple. The temple was on the top floor, come forward. Jonathan A. Stapley, others, including Jennifer Mackley, Cheryl Bruno, me and others have been building over the last decade a comparison contrast of rites and rituals in early Latter-day temples. Ron Romig and Barbara Bernauer were great. They were able to produce the Zodiac Temple Register. In it, you find names of presiders, proxy, applicants, etc. They did baptism for the dead. They did endowment. They did sealing. I have never found a record that says that they did rebaptisms, but Christopher Blythe, that good LDS historian, assures me that they did. One of the places, and this is blurred and it's done deliberately because it was painted that way, is a watercolor portrait of Fort Martin Scott. It laid in between Zodiac and Fredericksburg, about a mile and a half one to the other, three miles from Zodiac to Fredericksburg. The Germans and the Mormons were in competition for army contracts. The fort is gone, but it has been built as a recreation. You will be able to go out to it and look around. It'll be three minutes from the main venue, and I, I encourage you to do so. It is truly interesting to see. Here are various artifacts, pictures, paintings, timber from the temple here, slots, pictures of the river and the floodplain. This is in the Pioneer Museum in Fredericksburg. You should take your time this fall to go through it. In 1851, a flood wiped out the arable land. In other words, the Whiteites who were still living in a subsistence economy had to grow their own food. And with the land gone, they had to move. They moved up to Burnett County onto Hamilton Creek. There they built Mormon mills. Here are some pictures of what it looked like. This is part of the 1920 RLDS mission as they come north to look at Mormon mills. The mill was built on this bank. You see some of the old remnants. This shale is in drought right now in this picture, but I have seen when the water is coming down at three feet deep and very, very fast. At the bottom of this is the mill pond right below the mill. And I have friends, uh, Howard Holland, Melanie Holland, his wife, 
and their childhood friend 60 years ago who would walk across the ground from their farms to swim in that mill pond, they will join us at the cemetery at Mormon Mills. And here it is. It's a small one. There are 14 Whiteites buried in it. This is Mary Holly's grave. Excuse me. Yes, Mary Holly's grave with the death of their infant, Hiram A. The little stones are the stones of children and infants. On the outside of the cemetery are buried non Mormons. That's interesting that they honored that, and only Mormons are buried on the inside. These are pictures taken later. I deliberately blurred the background so you would focus on the steps. It's the only Texas Pioneer Cemetery that I have found that you have three steps up from the outside and three steps down into the inside. Think of a U of cedar. You can see it up there. And this points out to the creek. You're on a bluff. And if you walk out the upper right hand picture, you'll walk over the edge of a bluff of about 30, 40 yards at the most, and the creek is at the bottom. There is nothing up there, people, except the wind, the dead, and the memories that they had, and those of their descendants that remember them. The Baptist Fellowship of Marble Falls have so wonderfully offered the services of their school bus and their church suburban to carry our tour members up from the Falls of the Colorado Museum up here in two groups to walk on these sanctified lands. This is the grounds of the Fort Crohan Center and Museum. These are millstones from the White Eye Mill back at Hamilton Creek, about six miles away. Take a moment and orient yourself. This is a desk. Here are the pigeonholes, the room for the registers, the desktop, and then you can see the rest of it. Lyman White worked at this desk. And you'll be able to see it in the Fort Crohan Museum. Hallie and I have been here a number of times. I participated in the Fort Crohan Day. We had a wonderful time. What you're seeing in these buildings are the original buildings of Fort Crohan. How they managed to preserve them for 170 years is beyond me. If you were an officer with a wife, this is your home, officer's mess. By 1853, the Mormons had busted financially. Noah Smithwick, who I mentioned earlier, said that he had always wanted to buy a sawmill. So he bought him off of it. He wrote a wonderful memoir that you should find and read. And when he left in 1860 as a strong unionist to California, he took three former white eyed families with him, the Bashirs, uh, a Curtis family, and one of the Miller families. So they had a journey 120 miles down to Medina, Bandera Pass. They would have called it Banderi in the old days. Once again, I can't emphasize to you how beautiful the spring is in the hill country. Finding out where they first settled was difficult. 
what we have here, and thanks to Raymond Carter Jr. for finding it, is an old map that he managed to purchase with this sticker on it, Abandoned Mormon Settlement Under Colonel White, misspelled. They settled here before they went to Bandera. This is on the Medina County side of the Medina River. The sawmill here was a bust. The Comanche kept stealing their Mormon horses and there were not enough contracts anyway. So I can't see it on my map, but Mormon camp is here and Bandera is up there and you should be able to see Pipe Springs over there. They moved up to Bandera for three years, bought homes in the community, the brand new community, built them themselves. Uh, many of their descendants are still there. And in 1858, realizing that Brigham was not going to bring the Brighamites to Texas, Lyman had a revelation and decided they needed to go back to Jackson County. I think that was figurative language. If he had shown up in Jackson County, the old settlers would have murdered him. He took about 80 families. They traveled east for two days, and then he died. That group continued on to Illinois and then Iowa and eventually settled in the Gallons Grove area. Others stayed in Bandera and up in Fredericksburg and a small group moved out to California to the San Bernardino area. And that group back up in Oklahoma or the Indian nations, many of them converted to the LDS and moved on to Utah. This is a great photo of just how tough life was for the Mormons in the material culture. What were their triumphs? They brought mechanical engineering, milling to the frontier. They organized three county governments. They were sheriffs, county commissioners, land commissioners, school trustees, and integrated themselves into the Texas community after they died. Here are some prominent people in Bandera at the time the rest left. Ezra Alfie, he's pronounced Alpheus Chipman, died in 1913. He was the last surviving polygamous male in Texas. William Curtis would follow his brother out to San Bernardino, California, where they were part of the RLDS revival in 1865. This is the George Hay family. Uh, you see Curtis's, Hayes, Risinger's, Lankford's, all of them still have descendants living in Bandera. In 1865, our LDS missionaries came down from Iowa, built an open air bowery, meaning they put down a wooden floor with four corner posts and then put tree boughs across the top to protect from the sun and preached revival. Joined the church headed by Joseph Smith III. 35 of them did, and the RLDS became a fixture in the Texas Hill Country. I'm going to end it here. I want to thank Barb Walden and Historic Sites Foundation for sharing this time with me. I love the story, and I think it's important. And thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mel. Thank you for sharing all this information. Um, now that you've given us a good understanding of Lyman White's story and the journey that he and his followers made to Texas, let's dive into those fascinating connections that historians like you have found 
between Lyme and White's group and the early reorganization. So earlier in the series, Vicki Speak talked about a number of key people in James Strang's movement that later joined the reorganization. And it seems the same is true with Lyman White, uh, Lyman White's followers. Who were some of the key people who were, who were, or where were they living? And where were they living when they joined with Joseph III? And what were their roles in the early reorganization following Lyman White's uh, death? Sure. They came up, uh, the 80 members, up into Illinois and would settle in Iowa, Gallons Grove, most of them. The last names that you're familiar with, Curtis, Ballantyne, uh, and others, Hollies would join them later when they reconverted to the RLDS and came back from Utah. I should comment that almost 600 Latter-day Saints in Utah Territory would convert to the RLDS from 1865 to 1870. Many of them were former Whiteites, Hollies, Slades, and others, and they would settle in Iowa as well. So now that you've identified some of these people, let's explore the why. So why were members of Lyman White's group interested in joining the reorganization? It seems as though they had a number of options available to them at the time. So what was it about Joseph Smith III and the reorganization that drew their attention versus you know, a number of other leaders in Latter-day Saint groups they could have chosen? Most of the Whiteites were very, very anti-Brigham Young. They thought that he had done them on when they had brought the rest of the timber down in 1844 to Nauvoo. They thought they were going to get to steamship uh, the Marion and go back to Wisconsin territory. They never got to steamship. They thought Brigham Young had sold them out. In fact, it was George Miller. Uh, so in the beginning, there was anti-Brighamism. The 80 who came up in 1858 happily settled because they were going back to family. And one thing that I have not mentioned, if you will all remember that map of the dispersion, the diaspora of Mormonism, these were not individual little pockets separated from one another. They had family and friends in all of them. You had Whiteites who continually wrote to their friends and family in the Strangites and out in Salt Lake City. And the LDS were doing the same in Utah Territory. Everybody had family and friends in San Bernardino, California. There was an intersectionality and a fluidity to Mormonism. People were moving back and forth study Bishop George Miller's history of movement, study John Pierce Holly's. Holly was a missionary twice from Texas up into strain country, once up into reorganization company, and then reconverts, or rather converts to the LDS in the Indian nations, goes to Utah, sent on a mission to Iowa to convert his family. Nobody converts anybody, goes back to Utah, and then eventually converts to the RLDS and goes to Iowa. You have this fluid motion of Mormons going all over the West. So speaking of John Hawley, you uh, authored this great book, this great biography on John Hawley. And two questions. Um, what drew you to Holly's story that made you invest a significant amount of time and research into telling his story? And the second question is, is there another biography of a Lyman White follower that needs to be written, that needs to be shared? First, uh, John Holly leaped out at me in my research on the Lyman White colony. Holly was the son of Pierce Holly, the patriarch for the white eye community. And where everything's were happening 
not only in the Whiteite colony, but in the Mormon world late, larger, Holly was there. Holly was a witness. Um, he was in the Strangite world, converting to Whiteitism. He was in the Indian nations where he became converted to the LDS. He was in Utah Territory, the presiding elder in Pine Valley and for 11 years. And next year, when the conference is held at St. George, the history conference, uh, the Northern Tour will go through Holly's Pine Valley. It is one of the most beautiful spots in the American West. He was converted to the RLDS and moved back. But before he did, two significant events, he and his brothers were at Mormon Mountain, Mountain Meadows, the massacre site. Holly says he did not participate. John D. Lee said that he did. Nobody else remembers him. Uh, both of his brothers, George Holly and William Holly did. And Barbara Jones Brown of Signature Books will be giving a, uh, a presentation on William Holly and her Holly ancestry that goes all the way from Texas to Utah territory. The second thing is Holly did not want to take a plural wife. He was very happy with Sylvia. Uh, Sylvia and he had stood off Lyman White for three years before he allowed them to marry. And they were together for more than 60 years. He finally gave in to Apostle Erastus Snow and agreed to take a wife down at Pine Valley. Well, as he was driving across Pinto Creek, goes the folklore in the Holly families, uh, the axle fell off his, the rear axle fell off the wagon. Holly took it as a sign from heaven that he should not marry James Emmett's granddaughter. So he repaired his wagon, continued on to Salt Lake to sell his cheese and other goods and sent a messenger back to what became a very elated Sylvia who was told she was not going to have a sister wife. Holly was everywhere and then finished his career. When he reconverted to the RLDS and moved to Iowa, he had only lived half of his adult life. He would spend 30 years as an RLDS missionary throughout the Middle West, from Oklahoma to Iowa to Nebraska to Illinois. An amazing story. I would agree, and I thoroughly enjoyed your biography of, of John Hawley, and I put the title and publisher in the chat for anyone else who'd like to learn more about John Pierce Hawley. My last question for you, Mel, before we dive into the Q&A, um, the John Whitmer Historical Associations Conference will take place this September 21st through the 24th in Fredericksburg, Texas, which is not very far at all from this Lyman White history. Um, that we're learning about tonight. So I understand you and Eric Paul Rogers will be leading a number of tours to the historic places. You mentioned that in your lecture where this Lyman White history happened in Texas. And there's such power in going to those historic places and better understanding the history um, behind Lyman White and, and his followers. Can you talk a little bit about what's happening at the John Whitmer Conference this fall and what John Whitmer attendees will see during that September conference? I'd be glad to, and I am very, very honored to be a part of the planning committee and the making of things happen. Fredericksburg is three miles from Zodiac. It is 50 miles to Bandera and about 55 miles from Burnett to the north. It is the center of 19th century Mormonism in the Texas Hill Country. These are small communities. 
and they are forming the Texas West at the time. The Mormons were powerful influences for civilization, for creating economies, creating communities, creating county governments. And for me, importantly, there is not one sniff. Boy, that's an old historian term, one sniff. There is not one instant historically of violence between the Whiteites and the Texans and the Texas Germans and the Anglo Texans. When White dies, the Houston Chronicle gives a wonderful eulogy in the newspaper saying how honored they were to have such a people on their frontier, bringing civilization and Americanism. Let me emphasize to the, to the watchers, this is a white man's world in which these whiteites work. They are elitists. They operate in a white Mormon savior complex which is at the heart of restoration theology. While all of the sects to one level or another certainly allowed peoples of color to join and the RLDS were very early in allowing uh, black preachers and evangelists. Uh, this was a white man's world and this is one of the major problems that most of us historians, including myself, trying to get the voices, the authentic voice and authenticity of the people of color in America, including Native Americans, into the story. I am working right now on those Whiteites and free-range Mormons in the Indian nations. When the LDS leave their mission in 1860 among the Cherokee, there are four LDS branches, 120 members, 20 native elders and priests ordained and set apart. And when the mission opens 17 years later, reopens, they're all gone. There's no record. And I have been trying to find that record and failing so far, but as God's willing, I'll find it and I'll share it. And I'll encourage all of you listening tonight, look at the voices for our restoration women. Look for the voices of our restoration peoples of color. We do not have a complete story. We have a good story. We have an exciting story because guys love to talk about ourselves, but we don't have the whole story. And I would encourage you all to jump in and look for it and add to it where you can. Well, thank you, Mel. And for anyone interested in learning more about this year's John Whitmer Historical Association Conference, Lexi, I think has already dropped the John Whitmer link in the chat uh, where you can learn more about the September conference. And with that, I'm afraid we'll bring our evening program and the entire Stories of the Scattered Saints lecture series to a close. Our sincere thanks, 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 thanks to Melvin Johnson for sharing with us tonight and for revealing this fascinating side of the Lyman White and the Texas Saints story. Um, thank you for all this information. Also a big thank you to Peter and Lexi for helping out behind the scenes this evening and throughout the spring lecture series. You two are the best and you definitely deserve some time off. And, and lastly, an immense amount of gratitude to all of you in the audience. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us throughout the spring lecture series. Thank you for your love of a good story and for generously supporting the historic sites and the Alma Blair internship program through your generous donations. We really appreciate your passion for preserving the past. And we look forward to gathering with you again this fall as we will continue to explore more fascinating stories, uh, more people and places and artifacts in Community of Christ history. So until then, keep reading your church history, 
Visit one of the Community of Christ historic sites if you can this summer. It's well worth the trip. And uh, have a great summer, everyone. Thanks again.